So well, this is the hardest bit, but anyway, uh, good, here we go. So, uh, hello everybody, thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and chat to you, but also your time and to get a good turnout. Uh, I'm Kishan and I am an honorary lecturer at Hull York Medical School and as well as an MD candidate where I'm writing uh, very early stages but started an MD on what is the impact of an interplay between social and mainstream media on global public health communication during a pandemic. Um, so that's a little bit of background. In terms of uh, a disclaimer that I have to put on all this stuff, I'm really fortunate and grateful for all my uh, people that employ me that allow me out to speak. Um, but I need to make it very clear that this is my personal views and nothing that I say um, should be taken as any kind of views of any of the people that, that employ me, really. Um, but anyway, so I, ha I had to think about your 12 tips assignment. And I wanted to really see how I could add value to what you guys are needing to do and what you guys are needing to achieve. So we'll do that more in the Q&A discussion. But then I thought, how can I share a little bit about my story and my portfolio career without the GP bit um, to really help you so you get the most value from this? And I, I was thinking about this over the last couple of days and I've kind of distilled it down into this. Um, I'm going to share my social and mainstream media journey. And then we're also going to touch on the, this conflicting relationship between social media and mainstream media, how we are in a world, sadly, where there is clickbait that is valued more than scientific fact. And what kind of environment does that create for the patients that we signed up to serve? I would suggest it's quite a dangerous environment. I'd also suggest that it's one that as healthcare professionals, we really must speak out and make sure that we do the best for our patients. I've always seen personally that media and anything that I do in the media is an extension. It's a digital extension of my Hippocratic Oath. And first, do no harm. But, but secondly, how do, can that platform be utilized to give voices to those that may not have a voice, whether that be junior doctors, whether that be healthcare professionals that are under the cosh on the front line, or most importantly, members of the public. And there's some core skills and components around that that we all have as clinicians. And those are those communication skills. But then obviously we have the values that we sign up to, and these are just three, there's loads. But, but the values that we have as healthcare professionals, how do we transpose that into a clinical environment? Uh, sorry, into a virtual environment with our clinical communication skills. Then I'd like to move on to what does this mean for healthcare in the digital world? And then the slightly controversial element of the talk, but perhaps and potentially is the, the confluence of political and scientific communication. Um, we are going digital. Um, I think it's fascinating to see that there's no CEO in the world that has advanced the digital agenda. It was actually a biological entity. And that biological entity, i.e. SARS-CoV-2, has advanced the digital agenda by possibly 10 to 15 years. Overnight, we are doing things that we would never have thought of even possible before. Uh, so what I'd like to do first, if it's okay with you guys, is just give you a little summary of my career on a slide. Now, throughout all of this, I've been keen to provide and improve patient care through numerous routes, both internal and external to the NHS. And I've taken an entrepreneurial and creative approach, an innovative approach to medical communications. This started off when I was 15 years old, doing my GCSE work experience in Specsavers, and I carried on doing it until uh, 22, so when I was a fourth year medical student. And then I did some teaching and training with ID Medical, a locum agency, and we built ID Medical School and we taught, uh, I think the final tally was about 1,250 healthcare professionals at physical courses over five, six years. Clinically, uh, I used to work in the NHS. My NHS role now is more with uh, as a mentor for NHS England uh, Clinical Entrepreneur Programme uh, and obviously my involvement with, with HIMSS and the, the clinical component or the clinicians of that. 
but clinically I actually work at the Hospital of St John and St Elizabeth, which is a private urgent care centre in London. Uh, so I just do that to keep my licence ticking over. Medical education and educational generally has been a very big part of my career. Um, so obviously I went to medical school at Leicester 2004 to 2009. Then I went, did two degrees at University of Nottingham, a master's in medical education, which was 2013 to 2015, and then an MBA, which is a master of business administration at Nottingham Business School. Uh, absolutely delighted to be at Hull York Medical School now. Um, and across all of that, I've had tremendous uh, resource poured into me by the taxpayer. So I'm absolutely adamant in my belief that they they get a return on investment off that because there's no way I could have afforded I could have sorry afforded those degrees. So I'm incredibly privileged and lucky that the stars aligned, so to speak, and the skills that I built in these three boxes on the top um led me to to get involved with obviously mainstream media and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec finally i currently work full-time for astrazeneca um and i'm involved in medical education there in addition to medical affairs and um yeah so that's all my disclosures really in terms of what i do the common theme that runs through this is dyslexia and the sad thing is, I didn't know that I had dyslexia until four years ago. So I went through quite a lot uh, of failing the MRCS, the member of, uh, membership of Royal College of Surgeons exams. And it was only until that I was doing my MBA that I actually felt that challenging the stigma of a doctor who might be dyslexic was actually okay. So what that actually allowed me to do was break down so many barriers to... The, the, the different silos within my career. So I could learn something here in Specsavers and apply it on Five Live or in medical school or wherever. And, and that is something that I am talking about in terms of my MD completion that I mentioned to you before. So that's a little summary of me to so say, you know, kind of who's talking to you. And I'd like to take you back to 2013. I know that we've got a very wide audience on the call. Um, a very varying stages of careers and I think it's worth just mentioning briefly that because I kept on failing MRCS and I couldn't complete sorry I could complete core surgical training which I did I did foundation program training and then core surgical training but then they tried to bring in a change of regulation early where when I signed up for core surgical training um, it was a entry requirement MRCS passing it to ST3 they wanted to try and make it an exit requirement for CT2 and bring that regulation early by about seven weeks. Now, obviously, I didn't really like that. And thankfully, I passed MRCS. Sorry, I passed core surgical training, but I was one of the last people to get through without MRCS. And I will always remember a discussion that I had at my ARCP. And everybody will remain nameless. But I was told, if you're taking two years out and you're only getting a master's, then we don't think that's a very good use of your time. We think you really, if you're taking a year out, you should get a PhD. Now, <laughs> saying that to a dys an undiagnosed dyslexic who was you know, also not able to afford the tuition fees for a master's, I turned around and said to them, well, are you gonna pay for the PhD? And they said, no. And I said, okay, well, thanks. I'm quite happy to go to Lincoln, which I helped brand UMED, uh, Undergraduate Medical Education Department. And I had a great four and a half years there. And the only reason that I'm doing what I'm doing now is because of my time in Lincoln, because I got time out from training. I didn't do nights. I didn't do weekends. The conventional thinking was, oh, this is easy. You can therefore go and pass your exams. Um, but that, that wasn't the case. So a big part of my time at Lincoln and and my initial kind of foray into social media and media was very much doing the right thing. When you see headlines like this, and you also know that they're not made up because I've worked in A&E departments where I've seen similar, it was a case of how can we speak out and help others? Uh, this is Phil Hammond, who's a, a very good friend of mine now and mentor. And he took me under his wing in the early days of this where I didn't necessarily quite appreciate what 
uh, I was getting myself into and that's pro probably the best way of discussing that and we can ask we can talk more about that in the Q&A um, so here we go so then when it comes to utilizing social media I could see that there was a real opportunity in terms of to build new media organizations with what Facebook was doing and I can remember writing an essay on my MBA about business intelligence and the digital economy and it was how can we use live streaming because we were one of the first people to do that and way before a lot of mainstream media broadcasters how could we do that and we that's organic reach so that means that's free I don't have to pay anything for that and that went to one million people and we also added a uh, contact list to that and we've got 1000 people giving us their email addresses now to give you an example to spend i don't even know what it would cost to via facebook ads to get that to a million people now but it's a lot because i spent 250 dollars trying to get a video that went to 13,000 people organically and we managed to get it to 26,000 people so this is a great example of first mover advantage and it's a great example of there's so many other technologies that are coming online that the next generation and the generation below them, Generation Z or Generation Zoom or the iPad generation who were born in 2010 and beyond, which are uh, 2.5 million in number at the moment, will kick on. And I'd really like you to think about that as well for our discussion, because these technologies will impact the health care that we can provide our patients. So we really need to think about that. Anyway, one thing led to another. Uh, I managed to launch uh, What Med Media when I introduced Jeremy Corbyn to something, uh, to a, a rally at Thanet. And, you know, the most important thing that I got from this was I actually met Candy, who's a nurse who Jack and I stayed in her house and we connected over social media. And I made a real friend. Yes, I got to interview the leader of the opposition at the time about the NHS, which was amazing. And it was a good opportunity. But it, it, this showed me some other stuff. It showed me the power that we can use social media. So we crowdsourced, um, not just for cartoons. We actually helped crowdsource £30,000 plus, I think, maybe even more, I can't remember, for Chris Day's legal challenge. But then also on a smaller scale, we managed to get Ben Jennings to do these cartoons to help communicate messages that the BMA at the time were just unable to get across, and they weren't. Uh, I managed to go on Sky for the first time in November 2016, and that was uh, quite funny in my mind because I didn't know that that was a camera behind the auto queue. So the number of people that ribbed me in terms of saying that, why are you checking yourself out on the camera? I genuinely didn't know. The setup is there's a camera, there's an auto queue, you're looking at the auto queue, and the camera's behind it. But the reason that I was looking at the auto queue is because it's the first time that I was in a studio environment. I didn't know what the questions were. Stephen Dixon was really nice, he was lovely, but I was looking at the auto queue so I could see the questions that were coming. And the only reason that I was doing that is because that dyslexic mind where the, the last previous environment that I was in that was similar to this was a theater. It was an operating theater. And I can remember but getting fired questions as a medical student by a now retired professor of vascular surgery who said to me, ah, oh, Kishore, so I got my name wrong, but well done, you've managed to find your way to the library and you've actually managed to answer a question properly. Now I found that way more stressful being quizzed in, an, a, in a hostile and aggressive manner in theater where I'm wanting to try and be a surgeon than I did in a Sky studio with the lights and the cameras, but it was that transferable skill that I'm trying to get across here. Um, then Jack and I, uh, we're left unsupervised in Sky Studios and we found a Grey's Anatomy set and we, we, we did that, which I thought was quite funny. But more importantly, I actually realised what the global nature of communications, what was happening. So straight after that interview, uh, I literally got on a plane and went on holiday to Mumbai or India. And the only reason that I said to Sky that, look, I'll come down to the studio and I'll come and sit there is because again, from a doctor's perspective, I understood the value of that face-to-face -face communication rather than a down-the-line interview. 
I kept in touch with Stephen, who was a massive uh, mentor again and friend. And he gave up his time to, to do this, which was direct to patient education where he discusses diabetes. And we got that to 32,000 people organically. Now, he thought that was great because Channel 5 News went to 25,000 people or the regional news. So he saw the potential in this. And I don't know if you guys remember this, um, but he phoned me the night before at 10 a.m. Oh, sorry, 10 p.m. saying, Kish, do you want to come and do the papers with me outside Sky? Uh, I don't know why that slides there. Sorry. So he goes, do you want to do the papers with me outside Sky? And I said, yes, I'd love to. So I had the opportunity to be with Stephen outside the Royal London, critiquing the cyber attack live as it was happening. I was scheduled for the eight o'clock, nine o'clock, oh, sorry, yeah, eight, nine and 10 on the hour, every hour where they did the papers review and the producers loved it. And they said, actually, why don't you stay? So we did another two segments. We stayed there till 12. And it was really interesting to see how governmental responses were actually shaped and changed as a result of what we were doing. And I can talk about that again in a, in a bit later in the Q&A, if that's of interest to you. Um, but the other thing that's also important is my lesson here in terms of media was there were loads of other news outlets that weren't there at the beginning, but because Sky were there, then other ones turned up. And they were trying to poach me and say, oh, do you want to come on this? Do you want to come on this? And I was like, oh, no, I'm here with Sky. And they're like, but why not? Why don't you want to go on this? And it was like, well, firstly, I've committed to Sky and I'm here for that. And I wanted to do the segment, record it and then publicise it. But equally, I wanted to concentrate on that. And also, I have a good relationship with them in the sense that it's live, whereas all the other ones were pre-recorded. So the other thing that we can discuss in the Q&A is the different types of media, the different types of opportunities that will open up to you and which ones I would suggest you take and which ones I would suggest you uh, avoid with a barge pole. But let's bring it back to why we went into medicine, patients. And they have got a very difficult time at the moment. They're in a world where information is being chucked at them and they don't know what's true. I don't know what's true. I'm a doctor and I find it difficult to see. So this isn't even trying to be patronising or condescending to patients and members of the public. And that's why it's important that these lectures go out to the public domain. And so I don't know if you guys know Professor Eric Topol. Um, he has been a great influence for me. And I was amazed, I was so privileged to be able to meet him. And he signed my book like an absolute geek that I am. Um, but he was talking about how he was launching the Topol Review, which was about how technology can be used to release time to care. And then I found this uh, Time article, which was from 2014. And I think Eric Topol is mentioned in this, and that's why I found it. So I didn't see this actual article of Time, but it's so true. Look at it in terms of the Apple Watch is just the start, how wearable tech will change your life, like it or not. This is coming. And as healthcare professionals and physicians and nurses and physios and doctors, we have a responsibility to our patients to make sure that this tech is used for good, not bad, as, as is the case with any technology. So other things that I'd recommend you reading are The Creative Destruction of Medicine and also Deep Medicine by Eric Topol. And I'll send you a PDF of this afterwards or I'll send it to Paul and he can forward it on. But there's a great article that's linked to there that you can click on and look at. So. Let's have a quick think about what COVID is like and the COVID-19 world. This has changed our lives professionally and personally in ways absolutely unimaginable. It's made even worse by a social media landscape where you don't have to be an expert to get an audience. We've seen the examples of people who are uh, of all walks of life, whether they be politicians or members of the public or whoever, Getting a sound by going outside, for instance, I don't know, um, NHS Nightingale, saying, look, it's empty. What are they doing? They don't know what's going on, but, but they're using the media in a way to serve their purpose, which is drive clicks, drive views, drive engagement with their content. And it's also worth thinking about that the fact that the communication tools that unite us can equally divide us and be incredibly detrimental, both on a personal and population level. And 
the first step in thinking about this is we need to realize that the business models behind certainly facebook and that this is in the literature and that it's in it's published that that the business models are around that it's not just facebook to be fair it's lots of different social media companies but i've got source material that i can quote in terms of facebook which is a book called Zucked, which I haven't planned. I don't know where it is. I'm looking around, but it's uh, by Roger McNamee, who's an early angel investor in Facebook. And we know that in the early days of Facebook, they ran experiments to see if they can make people feel sad. They also are very aware that these devices, which I'm not criticizing the devices, far from it. I love it. The tech is amazing because the tech has been a leveler for me. So it allows me to compete given my dyslexia because what I was told when I was screened in 2016 and then diagnosed in 2017, but then I had severely dyslexic traits, but highly advanced coping strategies. So I'm not knocking the technology. I think it's great. I wouldn't be able to do what I do without it, but I think we need to be really mindful of the fact that this technology can be used for harm. And another great book that I would recommend and suggest that you use is Digital Minimalism. Um, I wouldn't uh, implement all of this, but elements of it I think are true. Because we know that social media and these devices are addictive as crack. There, there are business models in terms of how do we hook people on. And there's that old saying, if you're not charged, then you're the product. Um, so I would implore you to think about that and we can have a discussion about that in the Q&A as well. Um, the, what was I going to say? So we're on 31 minutes. I think we've been going for about 20, 25 minutes maybe. So I'm going to start wrapping to an end now in a sec, but I've got some more slides from another talk that I've given about COVID and media, which we're going to come to in a sec, but we've got all these, these technologies and we've got the opportunity, but are we really utilizing it? And I would suggest no. The information highway, digital superhighway, is only going to get more with the advent of 5G and then 6G. Some of the problems that we're having, for instance, with virtual consultations, we can't lay our hand on an abdomen of a patient at the moment. When 6G comes, you will be able to. When 3D printing, when artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, when all these technologies come together, we are going to be left with an incredibly complicated landscape. And I implore you to take it as your responsibility to upskill yourself on these technologies. You are medical professionals, you are learned skills that are in, imminently transferable. And I think they're absolutely vital. And the reason that I would say that, and I'm going to bring it back to COVID now, is because of this. I'm going to if you hopefully this sound plays i'm going to give it a try i think it will but this isn't it um hold on, maybe it will maybe it won't here we go right so this is nigel pearson the ex watford manager talking about covid and i'm just going to play it and then i'm going to it's only 30 seconds but then i'm going to talk about why this is significant in terms of how i was reacting to the news I don't think we had any great leadership last night listening to the Prime Minister. I was totally underwhelmed by the, um, yeah, by the lack of leadership and clear message uh, in terms of what, what was said uh, in that press conference. Um, I think it's important that, that, I mean, we are trying to be proactive ourselves and I think what is very important is that, you know, uh, hopefully the Premier League um, will make strong decisions based on what is right for uh, everybody within within the game. We told all the players to stay at home. Indeed, all the technical staff as well, all the training ground staff. So, you know, it's it, we've done that as a, uh, as a precautionary measure because we've currently got one player who's been um, uh, awaiting test results um, on his symptoms. I mean, we currently don't have uh, anybody with uh, a, a positive uh, return of a result, um, but I think it's in the current climate. It's it's pretty inevitable that we've all, or we all will have contact with somebody who um, either has the virus. Okay, 
So that was in March 2020. And the reason that this was significant for me was because I completely glossed over the herd immunity piece at the beginning of this. Because emotionally, when the Prime Minister stood up and said, we need to get used to losing loved ones. And we also need with other leaders in the medical establishment, and I use the term lightly, quite frankly, we're telling people that we need to get used to burying our colleagues. And the reason that this was important for me as a video is because I completely glossed over that. I completely glossed over it. I didn't notice it. And I just thought, yeah, okay, fine. Herd immunity, it's acceptable, whatever. It's a term that I understand, fair enough. But I didn't really look into it in any great depth. I don't th and that is really important. And we've seen a couple of world leaders, um, one no longer world leader, but regardless. But there are two precarious parallels there in terms of how the confluence between the media technology that we have plus scientific messaging and political messaging ultimately reacts and leads to, leads to harm because both these two have resisted social distancing at the beginning they've lashed out against lockdowns played down the severity of their country's outbreaks attacked experts including in their own government attended large political events often without wearing masks and hiked the unproven benefits of medications and the trouble is, their actions have very real consequences. I think this is Ben Jennings again. So it's funny that a few years later, he would do this. And it was very important to the work that I do. But when, when the ex-President Trump came out and said, I see the disinfectant that knocks his house in a minute, one minute, and there is a way we could do something like that by an injection inside or almost cleansing. That has real impact and real consequences. And I know that people, more than a hundred, there was more than a hundred hospital admissions as I've got friends and colleagues out in the States. I know that people lost their lives for that. But the, the trouble is, is why was the person on the podium in the White House not speaking out against this? And it's, it's you know, I can understand why they don't want to, uh, it's, I'm not gonna get into that. But all I can say is the next generation of medical leaders absolutely have to speak out about that i watched contagion last night for the first five ten minutes because i couldn't get to sleep um pretty gritty pretty graphic but there's a great five minute segment at the beginning of that where they are talking about all the issues about you have scientific experts trying to warn the world about a problem but political experts who yes understand politics and balancing the economy and health and risk and everything else don't understand the gravity of the scientific problem in front of them. And look, I don't want to be accused of political bias in any way, shape or form, right? I don't want to make it political. I don't want to knock it. I genuinely want the UK to have a world leading response. But my personal belief is that we squandered an island advantage. And we squandered an island advantage when Many people wouldn't have seen this. The World Health Organization actually saying that herd immunity approach to a pandemic is deeply unethical. Whereas we were being told to just take it on the chin. So I'd like you to think about that. We're going to discuss that as well. Um, and there's some more tweets and source material. Um, this is a video that I'm not even going to bother giving airtime to, to be honest. But I think it's a, a useful point in terms of we've seen fake news. Are we now seeing the seeds of anti-science? Um, and I think President or the ex-President Trump potentially sowed some of those seeds of anti-science. And it's just a disaster in my mind that people will have problems with their health as a result. Um, so I don't know if that's going to make it play the video. Here we go. This is my God daughter who I'm God witness to because I'm not christened. So I can't be a godfather, which is a shame. I've not seen the film, but it'd be great to be a godfather. But that is the reason why I do what I do. And I speak out often at great cost personally. Um, but I think it's too important not to. So thank you so much for listening. Um, please do keep in touch. My contact details are here. Uh, I'm going to try and work out how to close this now and just stop the recording. Hold on.
How do I do that? This is the hardest bit. I hate it. Hold on. Uh, stop share, and then it'll give me. There we go. So let's stop that. And then. 